when you're asking, is it true that so-and-so said this, or more than that, is it true what he said in the sense that uh, what he said is correct, and we ought to act a certain way, that's philosophy. Anytime we assess the truth value of something, we're doing the field of what? Philosophy, and more specifically, it starts with an epis epistemology. Epistemology. Thank God, you guys. Some of you listened, all right? Um, because I, so I, I can't. I don't know how many of you are actually watching the videos. I mean, I, I see that you know it's got an average watch time of four minutes. I'm going, well, that's an hour video, right? Four minutes isn't going to get you the content, and if it is, that's boy, that's that's not what we're here for. Uh, how many of you ever watched a, a, a video on exercising? One person, two, three, three, four, okay. all of you. Have you ever seen a video on exercising? I have, but I, like, I don't watch them personally. Like, when I don't know. But you have, right? Yeah. Them, yeah. Yeah, sure. Did you get any like more fit by watching them? No, I don't watch all of them at all. Yeah, even <laughs> still, um, I, my point is that you don't get fit by watching a fitness video. You get fit by doing what the fitness video tells you to do, right? It's an action. In the same way, philosophy is an action. So not coming to class and not being part of the discussion, it's a lot harder to do the philosophical uh, exercises that are gonna cause you to gain wisdom. Now, a lot, see, a lot of people approach class, philosophy especially, as a class where you go in, you listen, you hear things, you memorize things, you spit them back out, you get your A, you walk off, you do a, um, a memory dump, and the class is behind you, and you'll never have to think about it again. Well, that is not why you have philosophy classes. You have philosophy classes not to memorize who Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Descartes, Hume, Kant, Leibniz, and all these people are. And what they believed, it is so that you can learn what they did, so that you too can do it, so that you can gain wisdom. After all, philosophy is what? The love of wisdom. And how many of you want to be foolish? Now the worst thing, and I, I've said this in another video, and I hope you heard it. You know, sometimes you hear people call you a fool, and you're like, oh yeah, I'm cool, man. That's, that's what it means. If you hear a philosopher call you foolish, or call you a fool, or say that you are practicing folly, the act of being foolish, that is the worst thing they can call you. It is the worst insult you should hear. And so our goal here is to create wise people, especially at HBU. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there's a large Christian component to this, given that you are at HBU, uh, the Baptist part, right, which is Christian. And so we are here to uh, do Christian philosophy at that. We're going to talk about this stuff from the uh, perspective of a Christian. That's something you should know. So philosophy is important to do. Now, watching the videos, that's why I believe that uh, online education, I'll be on record saying it, is substandard. If I had a choice between hiring somebody who got an online degree and somebody who got a face-to-face -face degree, I would go with a face-to-face -face degree every time. And it is just from the years of 15 years of my teaching that I know that those students who have gone to class, participated in class, were mentally available in class, are much smarter at the end of the semester than those who did it online. You just get too much out, too much more out of it. And I know this, I've been, I've, I've taken out of these classes too, both online and I, I know how it goes, okay? And I'm a pretty good learner on my own, but that's because I'm motivated. Take a sophomore, senior, someone with senioritis, oof, they just wanna get out of class, right? right? You guys are thinking degrees, you're not thinking knowledge. Some of you. Some of you are like, nah, I'm hungry, thirsty, give it to me. That's what I want. That's what I want. Okay? The degree comes as a result of it, of your thirst. That's where your degree means something. So we're trying to produce lovers of wisdom here. Okay. So
so, <clears throat> so far the class, well, we've had what is that kind of like five se sections, right? Mm -hmm. And you guys have watched five videos. Mm -hmm. and, we, and we've read probably two parts of one book, and that would be this book, The Five Dialogues of Plato. Make sense? And the first book you would have read out of this would have been Euthyphro. And uh, I gave you a little quiz on Euthyphro. And it was all right. I mean, most of you did all right. And the big question with Euthyphro, uh, at the end, there was like, describe Euthyphro's dilemma, the Euthyphro dilemma. And that's where you got stuck. And that's the real crux of the lecture. The real lecture on Euthyphro has to do with the dilemma. Can anybody tell me what that is? Yes? Um, that there's things that are holy, holy because they're holy, like because the gods like them, or do the gods like them because they're holy? Right. <laughs> now, why? It, it's a dilemma. You got a problem here. What's the problem with it? I mean, that's the question. If I say pious or holy, right, or the good, okay, uh, some might say the good's a little di distinct from that, but we want to know, do the gods like holy things because they are holy? Well, give me a holy thing. Give me, give me an action that is holy. Pray. Praying. Okay, sir. Do the gods like praying because it's holy? Or is it holy merely because they like it? Why is there a problem with this? Why does each side of this dilemma cause a problem? Both answers are problematic. That's what I'm saying, and I want to know why they're problematic. Yes. Yeah, interesting. Okay, yeah, and you, uh, interestingly enough, kind of did a thing called question begging. You know what question begging is? It's where you presuppose something before proving it. So you say, if the gods like something immoral, right? You've already presupposed it's immoral. Um, if they like something immoral, that means it's moral. Okay, you're already making the claim that they're wrong to do so. But let's give an example of what you think would be immoral. Let's say playing basketball with newborn babies. Okay, they don't dribble that well, but you do your best, and then you go slam dunk a newborn baby into the 10-foot rim, breaking the rim, coming down, and, you know, and, you know, just, yeah, you know, dead babies everywhere. And the gods like that, and you're like, I'm doing good, and you go, yeah, the gods wouldn't like that. You go, why would the gods not like? Why would the gods not like that? Okay, then you go because it's bad. Well, wait a minute. If it's good just because the gods like it, that means killing babies is good. But that goes against our intuition. We go, no, no, no. Killing babies is bad. The gods would not like that, right? Why wouldn't they like that then? Because it's not good. So they want us to care for infants, treat infants well, nurture them, right? Don't kill babies. That's bad. And why do the gods want you to take care of babies? Because it is good. Okay, well, good. So is that a problem then? Yes. Because part of being God, or God's, has to do with being the highest ordered being. And the highest ordered being shouldn't have to answer to anything. There's nothing higher than that. But if they have to answer to that which is good, that means there's something above the gods. 
that the gods must not be as godlike as they profess to be. Does that make sense? Has goes to the to the nature of godness. And so there's this thing called the good to which Plato will uh, aspire, we'll talk about. And they call that Plato's God. And they call it the good. So this idea is that you've got a dilemma. You either diminish the godliness of the gods by saying they have to aspire to something greater than themselves, goodness, or you diminish goodness to merely the arbitrary will of the gods, which could be, like you said, pretty crazy. And that's the dilemma. And you go in a circle. It creates what's called a vicious circle, going back from one to the other. Why would the gods like it? Because it's good. Why is it good? It's good because the gods like it. Well, why would they like it? Because it's good. You see how it goes in a vicious circle. And that is the euthyphro dilemma. And so we have to ask ourselves, though, what does it mean to be good? Especially if you listen to the first couple lectures about the love of wisdom and it requiring virtue. Keep in mind, if I say, what is wisdom? And you say, uh, wisdom is knowledge rightly applied to its proper end. It is not merely knowledge and it is not merely the proper end. Wisdom has a component of both epist an epistemological component, knowledge, and a moral component. That is the application of it. Moreover, it has a metaphysical aspect to it because what we're dealing with is that which exists, the world. And that's why that's important. We'll talk, metaphysics is gonna be uh, something we talk about quite a bit, especially when you talk about who you are, what you are by nature. So one of the things you're going to have to notice about this class and about Socrates, Plato, is it challenges you to define your terms very, very specifically. What do you mean by that? So in the case of Euthyphro, they want to know what is piety. What is piety? And some of the things he offers are not going to work. In the Mino, they want to know a certain question. Who read the Mino yet? You did. Okay, I did assign it. You did get that, correct? Good. Who is not, who is unaware of how things are working on Blackboard, just to go off on a tangent? You know how to get to the announcements. You know that I announce when the videos are up and I put the lecture and then I'll put in the content, a little quiz, right? I'm gonna try to continue this practice. Gives you a lot of small tests, keeps you accountable and builds a grade. I like how that works, okay? And simple. All right. They are asking simple questions like, what is justice? these definitions and you're going to notice I'm going to do that in everything I asked what's philosophy it's love of wisdom what is you know wisdom knowledge rightly applied to its proper end you're going to notice that then I go into what is knowledge and we start talking about epistemology right at the same time we have to talk about the ancients and the ancients right now are Plato and we're talking about his teacher Socrates and his teacher Socrates had these dialogues that Plato wrote down Socrates did not that would be a test question. Um, they didn't write down his stuff. And he asked these questions. What is justice? And then he gets to Mino, right? Back from my tangent. One person's read Mino, I need you to read it. What is the first question he's asking? Um, is virtue the sort of thing you can teach someone? Yeah, is virtue something you can teach someone? Or is it your innate? Or you're born with it, is it innate? Yeah, great question. First, we have to understand what virtue is. The questions he asks are, what is justice? 
What is goodness, right? And of course, Mino is going to have the same problems you're going to have, except for one thing, is he thinks he knows it all. And that's and so did Euthyphro, by the way. Euthyphro was saying he's just. Why was Euthyphro thinking he was so pious? What was Euthyphro doing? Wasn't he prosecuting like his father's or his father? Yeah, his father. he was to prosecute his father for murder. He thinks he's so pious in doing so. Would you prosecute your own dad? Out of the right times, yes. If he murdered somebody, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, is that a good thing? Some people are like, no, I'm, I'm honorable. I'm, I mean, loyal to my dad, right? Well, okay. That's, uh, yeah. Objectively, it's not a good thing, but subjectively, it's not a good thing. Subjectively, what does subjectively, subjectively mean? It's just based on pleasurable. Based situation and based on how I feel about the situation. Your feeling. I mean, like, because based on it being my dad, that's gonna the base of that is gonna be feelings because, like, I feel like he's my father. I'm gonna. So does so does Socrates want you to to rule your life by your feelings? No, I don't think so. Absolutely not. <laughs> but like in this situation, like if I had to indict my dad, like right? So in this situation, that's the situation where he wants you to be able to think, not feel. Okay. That's that's the thing because in those situations, that's when your that's when your feelings are most strong. Right. So should it be a give and take of like because like. Look at the, the way that you can feel for you feel for my dad, I feel like I'll be able to feel for the victim that he killed. Maybe you can't feel for it. Maybe you hate the victim. If I do, I still gotta look, I still gotta think then be like is It's think, cool? not feel. Yeah, that's that's cool? the thing about that's the thing about that's not saying emotions can't um, help us understand something because yeah. they certainly are indicative that something's wrong. Right. If I am sad, there, there's a reason for it, and that's informing me something's wrong. But uh, look, look. Let's imagine you're married and you catch the guy cheating on you. Right. You feel like killing the guy. Yeah. Is that the rational thing to do? No. Yeah, no. I mean, you're going to spend the rest of your life in the can, yeah, no, in the no. joint for his tryst? Yeah. No. I probably punch him in the face and move on. Well, even then, even then, you've allowed your, your uh, emotions to punch him in the face, which yeah, is, again, emotions. assault. Yeah. You think you could hurt a guy? No. That's my thing. Like, I can't. I'm so, why would you punch him? It's a waste of your time, and, and then you'll just go spend some time anger. in the clink for. Release of my anger. Release go, hit a, my go, anger. go hit a punching bag. <laughs> I can't hit a punch. I can barely move a punching bag. Then, why would you hit a guy? Because I gotta feel the crunch of a bone somehow. It'll be your bone. It's not gonna be his. <laughs> That's fine. So you're, telling <laughs> you're telling me a, a punching bag's gonna hurt you more than a solid yeah, head? I can't even move a punching bag. It won't, it won't release the energy the same way punching him in the face or looking him in the eye while doing it. You must be a pretty skinny guy. Uh, no, I'm just a skinny girl. <laughs> that's why I wasn't asking anybody. Okay, that's, all right, we're all right. I, point being, what, is, what does he want? He wants rational beings. He wants us to use reason rather than emotion. And, and the way we do that is to separate that is to learn what we're talking about before we ever, and, and it's, it can get rather um, tedious and it can get emotional. So like last semester, a student got upset at me because we defined, I, I didn't define it. I asked somebody, she called somebody a racist, a certain president. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? Okay. She said, he's a racist. I said, what do you mean by that? And so we throw that term out very easily. She got so upset. Why did she get upset? Well, she didn't know the, the uh, she didn't even know she was, she didn't know the definition of it. She couldn't define it. And if you can't define it, how can you call somebody it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. She had a very emotional response to the, the president. She hated his guts. And so I offered her a couple definitions and she didn't want to take those either because if she took those definitions, then she'd have to conclude that he wasn't a racist, but she wanted to keep the, the view that he was a racist. And so um, it became, she got upset. Now, of course, you're gonna find out that Socrates makes people upset. And where is Socrates going when he meets Euthyphro? He's going to court. What is he going to court for? He's being prosecuted. He's being prosecuted. Why is he being prosecuted? He was not, uh, 
his prosecutors for saying that he does not follow the religion. Of the he denied the gods. So he's getting charged with three things. One of them is denying the gods. What's the second one? It is um, making the worst, the worst argument the better. Yeah. And then I'll forget the third. So there are generally Corrupting three children. things. What was it? Corrupting children. Corrupting the youth, impiety, okay, and de and denying the gods, okay, and that's what he's being charged with. Who is he being charged by? Well, there, there are a few, like Miletus and Anatus. Uh, but why are they being charged? Why are they charging? Well, you, you haven't gotten there. You haven't, you haven't read the Apology. Bottom line is, as he questioned people, seeking, he was told he was the um, wisest of all men, okay, by the Oracle of Delphi. And he's like, nah, I don't think I'm the, I'm not wise. I don't know anything. And so he said, I'm going to go test this. And he went and questioned people. And what happened is as he questioned those who professed to be wise, the poets, the artisans, that'd be the craftsmen, the poets being the, you know, the orators and the uh, artists and imagine the actors, right? In our contemporary times, like, you know, Scarlett Johansson telling me what to do or how to think about morals. Yeah, right. Madonna getting up there and saying, I'm famous. Listen to me and what I have to say. Katy Perry, right? I kissed a girl and I liked it. Um, and so <clears throat> why should I buy what they have to say? Because they're famous? Well, these people who profess to be wise, correct? And then you had finally you had the poets, the politicians, and the artisans, the politicians uh, were the last. Should I believe something to be good and right and just just because a politician says it? Do I, should I think that my politicians are wiser than I? Um, like oh my God. If you listen to the political rhetoric right now as they talk down to you, as they tell people, you know, smuggling who is and who is not moral in our country, right? And then they cut people off of social media and, and stifle free speech saying you don't even have a right to speak anymore. Saying, some of the, saying half the country needs to go get re-educated. That's communism, by the way. Socrates goes out and questions these types of people. What, what happened to him? Well, he's going to court over it. They accused him of things. And eventually, they're going to put him to death. Okay. And why? Because he proved to them, not, not just to others, but to, to them. It revealed to themselves that they were not wise. These people... These fools who profess to be wise were not just found out to their peers, but to themselves. And how embarrassing, right? Where you yourself even have to admit, yeah, I don't know. There are two types of people, right? And what are they? What? Those who have to be right and those that have to be right. Yes. Those who always have to be right and those who always have to be right. And we even talked about that. I had you guys discuss it. And one is an attitude. They're both attitudes, but one is an attitude of narcissism. This idea of allowing yourself to be wrong is a no-no. That you always have to be, keep up the image of being the one in charge, the one who knows, right? And in doing so... You get very mad when people chip away at your facade. What do I mean by the facade? That fake yeah. image, yeah, the mask of, you know, uh, always being right and being smart. Some of you think you're here to prove that you're smart, right? I sat in the back, I, I no, not to you people, but I hear people say, oh, I sat in the back, I didn't listen, took the test, got all A's, you know, and I'm like, sounds like you didn't learn anything, sounds like the class was a joke. If the class wasn't a joke and you didn't listen, you should have failed, right? There are other people who come in, they're like, man, I worked my butt off and got a C and I learned so much. And they got a C. 
I, I respect that person much more than the other one. And that's the person who's going to go through life learning and be becoming, building like, you know, how you exercise, you get all big and, or small or however, you know, whatever your goals are, right, for exercise. You do it, you get it by doing it. And in the same way, this will, if, depending on your attitude, one's going to stifle growth, the other one's going to cause it. Okay, one attitude. One is of humility, the other is of pride. Okay, humility is a virtue, pride is a vice. We're going to talk about that. So when Socrates asks you to throw these questions about justice and piety, he's, he's really saying, asking, if you're claiming to be pious, first you better tell me what you mean by it. And if you cannot tell me what you mean by it, how can you tell me that you are it? So let's talk a little bit about it. Well, I'll offer a little solution to uh, the Euthyphro Dilemma 2. What is meant by goodness? <clears throat> Can anybody give me a definition to start with? Don't, don't, don't feel you have to be right. A lot of you go, okay, I don't want to answer this question because I'm probably wrong. Well, that's not the goal here. The goal here is to start. Right? And then we move from there towards, we converge upon the answer. And I think that's, that's the, val uh, uh, the value of the Socratic dialogue is we start with something and go, nope, that's not it. And we push the side to go on to something else. Right? Sir, can you tell me something that's good? Or can you give me a definition of good? There's two ways to do this, by the way. Go ahead. Uh, by the way, first of all, what's your name, sir? Xavier. Xavier. All right, you've emailed me, or not. Maybe I've more, you wouldn't be the first Xavier I've, I've had. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure. Don't worry about it. Okay, you know what you need to do is you need to get your doctorate so you can be called Professor X. <laughs> okay? All right. Wait, what was the question again? What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, what do you mean by good? I mean, I, I think it kind of sounds similar to Proper end, so it has to yeah, that all sounds great. Um, yeah, but what, proper end has to do with goodness, right? Yeah. And I'm going to agree with that. Unfortunately, I've, you know, um, they're smart and you, you're stealing my thunder. Now, um, <clears throat> what is that, though? What does that mean? It means um, ideas that, and ideals that you learn. What are those things called ideal ideas? I want to let you know that the word idea comes from an idea, the uh, concept of idealism. It's very platonic, this, uh, this concept that there are things in Plato's heaven called the ideas, okay? And that we in here are not living in full reality. We have like a shadow of the ideas. We don't, we don't see the actual reality, okay? And our goal as philosophers is to to be able to experience that okay so it's interesting that you have that language but do you understand what you mean by it well that's what i was kind of getting at it was, keep going so ideas and ideals that are kind of formed by per individual so do you don't you form mean? ideas i mean no let's say uh you can experience the ideas, I suppose. You don't create them. That's what I'm saying. You don't create these ideas, right? Right, you don't. Okay, go keep going. So they're kind of uh, mastered. I wouldn't say mastered, but they're uh, founded upon experience. Sure. Or okay. Another Let's go backwards. It's just, we're just trying to ask what good is, right? Yeah. And uh, I hear ideas and forms and stuff like that, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. Do you know what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, it's, it's not that uh, the language is good because when, when, when Socrates, Plato talks about the good, right? It's this thing in heaven. It's not, you know, that when he's talking to Euthyphro, they're trying to get at what makes something good. So what, what Euthyphro starts doing is he starts like, you know, uh, 
talking about justice and piety and all that, and gods like it, and like it starts listing things that the gods might like, right? We gave instances of what, you know, we could do with kids and that would be bad, right? Uh, what are some of the things you would call good? Um, sacrifice. Sacrifice. That's called, yeah, self-sacrifice, right? Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, that's, that's, you would sacrifice yourself for others, nobly, hopefully, right? And that's good. And um, can you give me, yeah. Oh, charity. Charity, yeah. That's, uh, what Greek word is that, a, a, what, where does that come from? Agape. Have you heard of agape before? In the Christian church, it's for Christian love. Uh, you, sir, do you have anything? I was going to say charity. You can either be kind or be polite. Kindness, sure. Why not? Congeniality, uh, uh, good spiritedness, okay? Uh, anybody else? Now, being that good is uh, nice and friendly is not always virtuous, right? Can't no. be. It needs to be appropriate, okay? There are plenty of virtue. I mean, people who are. It's interesting because you think about evil and evil people, right? Do you think they're always like, Rah! you know? No, they're probably pretty congenial to some people and their friends, their family, perhaps, and yet still do very vicious things. Uh, but it is, you know, there's kindness is, is certainly a fruit of the spirit, as Paul would say, right? Peace, patience, kindness. How about you? You got nothing. No, no, no good things. Yes, you do. Nothing. You can say anything is good. Just tell me, X is good. I really don't know. I, I mean, I guess going to school is good. Learning is good. Yeah. Okay, so now you made a statement learning is good. So knowledge is good. Okay, sure. Uh, now, we see, so we get all these things that we attach this uh, predicate to called goodness, right? You know, if I said the shirt is red, red is the predicate, right? Goodness is the predicate. Charity is good. Self-sacrifice is good. Kindness is good. Knowledge. Knowledge is good. This coffee is good. If I had some, right? See, coffee or something, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're using the same word, but what do we mean by that? And so you start going, well, okay, we have instances of goodness, and we want to go, okay, we got all these paradigm instances of goodness and we can look at them or we can start with the method right remember the problem of the criterion it is a problem right you start with the definition of knowledge but then you go well how do you know your criterion's correct you know is it just arbitrary or just well because it follows the criterion so you're in a circle well in the same way you know you go why is it in the paradigm examples of goodness you know, why, why are all these things considered good? Is it because they follow a definition of goodness? Or do we derive our, our definition from that? And, you know, how did you learn goodness? Parents. Yeah, your parents. Did they give you a definition of goodness? What did they do? Mostly positive by bullying. By spanking you. <laughs> Bad. Putting a fork in the socket, bad. You know, um, hugging your sister, good. Sharing, good. Right? Is that a bad way to learn things? Are you sure? What if you learn stealing, good? Well, I mean, like, I'm saying in my case, but I'm. You were taught all good things and no bad well, things. Well, no, I mean, like, I think my parents are literally the best people in the world. Literally the best literally. people. Jesus is saying. Dang, oh, well, Jesus is about, okay, my parent, my mom is the best mom, literally the best mom in the world. Literally. literally. Is that a scientific fact? No, it's literally scientific. Good. Okay, cool. My definition. And all the other parents I've ever met. Cool. Mom. Well, my, really good. Mine were okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm not going to give them an A, okay, but uh, <laughs> I don't give them an F. Um, so I was taught stuff like that. Uh, how about you in the back? What's your name? Yes. Camila? Camilla? Yeah. Do you like it, it or E? E. Like some are like 
I'm Camilla, and some are like Camilla. Say it again. Camilla. Camilla. Okay. I just want to get it right. I don't. I, I don't want to be butchering it because I will. Um, how'd you learn good and bad? Um, by my parents. What did they do? They taught me wrong and right perfect. All of it, or did they give you a definition so later on you could apply it? Yeah. What was the definition they gave you? Don't do anything to stupid. I mean, come on, could stupid people be good? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then you have to define what stupid. So is. I mean, look. I mean, well, I mean, go make a bomb. I mean, you could be go make a bomb. It'd be very smart at that, right? That's not knowledge rightfully applied to its. Problem. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So the rightly applied is that part. I want to know how you knew what was good and what was bad, not what was correct or incorrect. You know, stupid indicates a sense of. I know what they mean, but don't, you know, you can't. how old were you when they said that to you? Three, two, one? Last week. Last week, yeah, <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> Dang boy, what are you doing? <laughs> ain't stupid, are you? All right, uh, you're probably a little older, probably 10 when they start saying, don't do things stupid, right? Before that, what did, how did they teach you? Um, do you have any siblings? Yeah. How many? Boy or girl? Boy. Get along? Yeah. Yeah. See, if you had a sister, maybe it'd be different. Who, do you have a sister? Yeah. yeah. You do too? Yeah. You had siblings? Do you guys fight? Um, sometimes. Sometimes. Are you two siblings? Oh, no. no. The way you're answering is like, yeah, we fight all the time. <laughs> um, look, I've got three young ones right now, and the two boys are at it all the time, right? You gotta teach each other to love each teach them to love each other, teach them to share. And it's very difficult, especially when kids, little boys, are kind of brain damaged. You know, their their brains haven't fully <laughs> you tell them to do it, they say, okay, they go do it again. <laughs> and it's not because they're looking at you giving you the middle finger, it's because of their brain development, you know, and impulse and stuff like that. So there's a certain repetition, mom and dad say yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, right? Don't push your sister into the street, okay? Don't push your sister at all, right? And you just give them, this is bad, instances, right? Share, this is good, right? Does it make sense of how they did it? Camilla, does that make sense how they did it? Yeah. Uh, how do they teach you colors? We'll get out, we're, we're gonna go into that in metaphysics later, but. They said, this is yellow, this is red, and they gave you instances of red and yellow, and they pointed to them, red, 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 right? Blue, 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 right? Blue on the masks, black on mine. And so you started being able to abstract, pull out from it the instance of what it is. Look at, look at me, Xavier, the idea of what it is. You are able to abstract the idea from the object. Okay, these properties, the property of redness. And later on, you are able to, you are able to abstract the moral property of the act. What is good about helping your sister? You recognize the good, what color is goodness? It doesn't have a color. What color is your sister? Either one of you. You don't have a sister, you have a brother. Oh, yeah. He does have color, right? Sometimes it's uh, probably about the same color as you. Mm -hmm. Do you have color of your hair? No. Okay. Uh, is he good? Is he good? Yeah, and is she good? Sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Is that goodness colored? No, it is not. He or she is colored right? But goodness is not. Are you shaped? Yes, you are. Is the goodness that you do shaped? No, the property we pull from it is, right? It's like saying, what's the shape of blue? So we talked about the shape of the desk, but blueness itself doesn't have a shape. So we're talking about pulling something out of it, recognizing something that's not physical, 
about some things that are done by physical things. Like we, we are physical bodies, we have physical bodies, and we do good things with them. But the goodness of those things is not physical. And we recognize that. See, this is an epistemological question about how we know things. For example, you see a good act and you know that it is good even if you do not see, even if you cannot quantify goodness, even if you cannot put it in a beaker and test it. I heated some goodness up to a, you know, 130 degrees on my Bunsen burner, then I added some badness to it. No, 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 that's not the way it works, is it? Moral properties are not physical properties, but they do exist. We do experience them. We do do them. And so when we ask what they are, it's very difficult to answer that question because in the same way it's hard to answer the question, what is red? Go tell a blind person, go explain to a blind person redness. Can you? No, you cannot. So, if you tried to, you might say, well, okay, uh, it's wavelength alpha, whatever alpha, whatever that may be. And the blind person could go read in Braille all about wavelength theory or particle theory, whichever theory he wants to get into. He becomes an expert on light theory, okay? Starts asking, when people start asking, what's red? He explains it textbook-like. And then they go, what's it like to see red? He goes, I have no idea. Because it's that thing that we experience the redness, right? That we experience the goodness. Because it's not a physical thing, but we recognize it, even if we cannot sense it physically. Even if it is not quantifiable. So then we ask the question, well, is it, is it just because, is it just an emotion liked by the gods? First of all, if there is no God, there is no one, no God to like it, all right? It's very popular nowadays to just say you don't believe in God. Well, then if there is no God, then there is no way God can make something good by merely liking it. Also, if there is no God, then there is no good that he would like either. What would it mean to have goodness without God? I mean, would you be held accountable to this goodness? Or the evil that men do? There'd be no accountability, so it'd be arbitrary. I mean, it's just like, yeah, it's good, so what? Who cares? All things are permissible without God. Hitler's not evil. Unless what you mean by evil is, I don't like him. I don't like what he did. If God does not exist, that is. Because goodness would be arbitrary. But if there is goodness, right, this thing, uh, then there is something that is even above the Greek gods. And Plato recognized that. There is in, uh, a chapter in a book that was edited it's called philosophy of religion and the book is and the chapter in it is called what euthyphro should have said and it's an answer to the question what is the good see plato offers through socrates two options the dilemma he then offered the third one that god exists that god is by nature good like a square is by nature shaped, right? You cannot have a shape, a square without a shape, can you? Can you imagine a square without a shape? You can imagine a shape without a square, right? Because you can have a shape that's a circle. But can you imagine a square without a shape? The answer is no. God being good by nature is like a square being shaped by nature. That is, God can do no wrong, cannot violate his nature. God cannot be non-God. A cannot be non-A, and God cannot be non-God. And if God is by nature good, God cannot be non-good. 
A shaped thing cannot be a non-shaped thing. A square cannot be a non-shape. It has to be a shape. And God has to be good because it's part of what he is. Thus, God's commands are good. And he enjoys his commands because they are good. And they are good because they are part of his nature. Are you in my philosophy class? Are you just stealing philosophy? Yeah. Good. <laughs> I'll test you later. <laughs> Thought we had somebody locked out of class. Anyway. So that's the third answer. Now, of course, in the polytheistic world of the Greeks, to, to suggest that there's something higher than the gods might be akin to denying the gods. And thus, you have something you can accuse him of. All right, let's reflect on what I just said. What did I just say? Was it... I wish I could say I came up with it. It was William Alston, but it is good stuff, and I, 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 that's where I hold what I agree with. God is by nature good. God is by nature good. How does that solve the Euthyphro dilemma? Um, because the act that Euthyphro was doing was by nature good. Or it's godly, yeah. and it's not arbitrary. Right? right? It's not just because God is not going to will babies killing themselves or killing babies because that is not good. And it's not merely because God whims it that way. It is God, God being good. This, that goodness does exist, and God's nature is bound up in that. Okay? Um, you said something, and I wanted to, to recall it. But uh, now... I think this is very important to us because if we are seeking wisdom, if we do want to be good, it seems to me that requires a certain belief. And some people might go find this offensive that I say, if you really want to know goodness, you need to know God, right? And some of you are all like, well, God doesn't exist, okay? then I would ask the question again, what do you mean by good if God does not exist? If God does not exist, what is meant by good? What do atheists mean by this? Now, interestingly enough, this is not saying atheists cannot be good. Just because, I mean, just because you deny God doesn't mean you're, like, colorblind or moral blind, okay? Like, you still recognize that hurting people is bad, that self-sacrifice is good. And, and some of the most judgmental people in the world are people who don't believe in God. How dare you tell me what, how to live my life as though I'm wrong to tell you how to live your life, Right? Go put your religion on somebody else. You've heard that, right? Or you've said it, maybe. Either way, you know, keep it in church, man. You're judging me as though I've done something immoral by judging you. Is it morally wrong to judge somebody? No. And if you're an atheist, you think so, right? But, but on what grounds? On what grounds, really? Come on. Are we, at, are we out of time? By how much? Three minutes. And nobody was going to stop me. <laughs> I was about to. I was oh, about I see you packing up, but I'm like, oh, wow, you must have to leave early. <laughs> okay, you can hit stop. Well, guys, 